1984, Part 1, Chapter 8, Part 2. A twinge of fear went through him. It had been a sufficiently rash act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had sworn never to come near the place again. And yet, the instant he allowed his thoughts to wander, his feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind that he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. At the same time, he noticed that, although it was nearly twenty-one hours, the shop was still open. With the feeling that he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about on the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say that he was trying to buy razor blades. The proprietor had just lighted a hanging oil lamp, which gave off an unclean but friendly smell. He was a man of perhaps sixty, frail and bowed, with a long, benevolent nose and mild eyes distorted by thick spectacles. His hair was almost white, but his eyebrows were bushy and still black. His spectacles, his gentle, fussy movements, and the fact that he was wearing an aged jacket of black velvet gave him a vague air of intellectuality, as though he had been some kind of literary man, or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft, as though faded, and his accent less debased than that of the majority of proles. I recognised you on the pavement, he said immediately. You're the gentleman that bought the young lady's keepsake album. That was a beautiful bit of paper, that was. Cream laid, it used to be called. There's been no paper like that made for, oh, I dare say fifty years. He peered at Winston over the top of his spectacles. Is there anything special I can do for you? Or did you just want to look around? I was passing, said Winston, vaguely. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well, said the other, because I don't suppose I could have satisfied you. He made an apologetic gesture with his soft-palmed hand. You see how it is. An empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand any longer, and no stock either. Furniture, china, glass, it's all been broken up by degrees, and of course the metal stuff's mostly been melted down. I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. The tiny interior of the shop was in fact uncomfortably full, but there was almost nothing in it of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted, because all round the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn-out chisels, penknives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends. Laggett snuff boxes, agate brooches and the like, which looked as though they might include something interesting. As Winston wandered towards the table, his eye was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making almost a hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness, as of rainwater, in both the colour and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by the curved surface, there was a strange, pink, convoluted object that recalled a rose or a sea anemone. "'What is it?' said Winston, fascinated. "'It must have come from the Indian Ocean. "'They used to kind of embed it in the glass. "'That wasn't made less than a hundred years ago, more by the look of it.' "'It's a beautiful thing,' said Winston. "'It is a beautiful thing,' said the other, appreciatively. "'But <coughs> there's... there's... Not many who'd say so nowadays, he coughed. Now, if it so happens that you wanted to buy it, that cost you four dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds, and eight pounds was... Well, I, I can't work it out, but it was a lot of money. But uh, who cares about a genuine antiques nowadays? Even the few that's left... Winston immediately paid over the four dollars and slid the coveted thing into his pocket. What appealed to him about it was not so much its beauty as the air seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. 
The soft, rain-watery glass was not like any glass that he had ever seen. The thing was doubly attractive because of its apparent uselessness, though he could guess that it must have once been intended as a paperweight. It was very heavy in his pocket, but fortunately it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing for a party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. Winston realised that he would have accepted three, or even two. There's another room upstairs that you might care to take a look at, he said. There's not much in it, just a few pieces. We'll do well with the light if we're going upstairs. He lit another lamp, and, with bowed back, led the way slowly up the steep and worn stairs and along a tiny passage into a room which did not give onto the street, but looked out on a cobbled yard and a forest of chimney pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged, as though the room were meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep, slantingly armchair drawn up to the fireplace. An old-fashioned glass clock with a twelve-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window, and occupying nearly a quarter of the room, was an enormous bed with the mattress still on it. "'We lived here till my wife died,' said the old man, half apologetically. "'I'm selling the furniture off by little and little. Now, that's a beautiful mahogany bed, or at least it would be if you could get the bugs out of it.' but I dare say that you'd find it a little bit cumbersome. He was holding the lamp high up, so as to illuminate the whole room, and in the warm dim light the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it would probably be a quite easy room to rent for a few dollars a week if he dared take the risk. It was a wild, impossible notion, to be abandoned as soon as thought of, but the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory. It seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair besides an open fire, with your feet in the fender and a kettle on the hob, utterly alone, utterly secure, with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There's no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Ah, said the old man, I never had one of those things too expensive, and I never seem to feel the need for it somehow. Now, now, that's a very nice gate leg in the corner there, though of course you'd have to put new hinges on it if you wanted to use the flaps. There was a small bookcase in the other corner, and Winston had already gravitated towards it. It contained nothing but rubbish. The hunting down and destruction of books had been done with the same thoroughness in the pro quarters as everywhere else. It was very unlikely that there existed anywhere in Oceana a copy of a book printed earlier than 1960. The old man, still carrying the lamp, was standing in front of a picture in a rosewood frame, which hung on the other side of the fireplace, opposite the bed. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, he began delicately. Winston came across to examine the picture. It was a steel engraving of an oval building with rectangular windows and a small tower in front. There was a railing running round the building, and at the rear end was what appeared to be a statue. Winston gazed at it for some moments. It seemed vaguely familiar, though he did not remember the statue. The frames fixed to the wall, said the old man, but I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building said Winston, finally. It's a ruin now. It's in the middle of the street, outside the Palace of Justice. That's right. Outside the law court. It was bombed in, oh, many years ago. It was a church at one time. St. Clement Danes, its name was. He smiled apologetically, as though conscious of saying something slightly ridiculous, and added, Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. "'What's that?' said Winston. "'Oh, oranges and lemons,' say the bells of St. Clemens. "'That was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. "'How it goes on, I, I don't remember, but I do know how it ended up. 
Here comes a candle to light your bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was a kind of dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under. And when it came to, here comes the chopper to chop off your head, they brought their arms down and caught you. It was just names of churches. All of the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. Winston, Winston wondered vaguely to what century the church belonged. It was always difficult to determine the age of a London building. Anything large and impressive, if it was reasonably new in appearance, was automatically claimed as having been built since the Revolution, while anything that was obviously of an earlier date was ascribed to some dim period called the Middle Ages. The centuries of capitalism were held to have produced nothing of any value. One could not learn history from architecture any more than one could learn it from books. Statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets, anything that might throw light upon the past had been systematically altered. I never knew it had been a church, he said. There's a lot of them left, really, said the old man, though they've been put to other uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? I've, I've, I've got it. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. There, now, that's as far as I can get. A farthing was a small copper coin, looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's? said Winston. St. Martin's? That's still standing. It's in Victory Square, alongside the picture gallery. A building with a kind of triangular porch and pillars in front and a big flight of steps. Winston knew the place well. It was a museum used for propaganda displays of various kinds, scale models of rocket bombs and floating fortresses, waxwork tableau illustrating enemy atrocities and the like. St. Martin's in the Fields, it used to be called, supplemented the old man, though I don't recollect any fields anywhere in those parts. Winston did not buy the picture, it would have been an even more incongruous possession than the glass paperweight, and impossible to carry home unless it were taken out of its frame. But he lingered for some minutes more, talking to the old man, whose name, he discovered, was not Weeks, as one might have gathered from the inscription over the shop front, but Charrington. Mr. Charrington, it seemed, was a widower, aged sixty-three, and had inhabited this shop for thirty years. Throughout that time, he had been intending to alter the name over the window, but had never quite got to the point of doing it. All the while that they were talking, the half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me three farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. It was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells. The bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple after another he seemed to hear them peeling forth. Yet, so far as he could remember, he had never heard real-life church bells ringing. He got away from Mr. Charrington and went down the stairs alone so as not to let the old man see him reconnoitering the street before stepping out of the door. He had already made up his mind that after a suitable interval, a month, say, he would take the risk of visiting the shop again. It was perhaps not more dangerous than shaking an evening at the centre. The serious piece of folly had been to come back here in the first place after buying the diary, and without knowing whether the proprietor of the shop could be trusted. However, yes, he thought again. He would come back, he would buy further scraps of beautiful rubbish, he would buy the engraving of St. Clemens Danes, take it out of its frame and carry it home concealed under the jacket of his overalls. He would drag the rest of that poem out of Mr. Charrington's memory. Even the lunatic project of renting the room upstairs flashed momentarily through his mind again. For perhaps five seconds, exultation made him careless, and he stepped out onto the pavement without so much as a preliminary glance through the window. He had even started humming to an improvised tune. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens, ye owe me three farthings, say the... Suddenly, his heart seemed to turn to ice and his bowels to water. A figure in blue overalls was coming down the pavement, not ten metres away. It was the girl from the fiction department, the girl with dark hair. The light was failing, but there was no difficulty in recognising her. She looked him straight in the face, then walked quickly on as though she had not seen him. For a few seconds, Winston was too paralysed to move. Then he turned to the right and walked heavily away, not noticing for the moment that he was going in the wrong direction. 
At any rate, one question was settled. There was no doubting any longer that the girl was spying on him. She must have followed him here, because it was not credible that by pure chance she should have happened to be walking on the same evening up the same obscure back street, kilometres distance from any quarter where party members lived. It was too great a coincidence. Whether she was really an agent of the thought police, or simply an amateur spy actuated by officiousness, hardly mattered. It was enough that she was watching him. Probably she had seen him go into the pub as well. It was an effort to walk. The lump of glass in his pocket banged against his thigh at each step, and he was half-minded to take it out and throw it away. The worst thing was the pain in his belly. For a couple minutes he had the feeling that he would die if he did not reach a lavatory soon. But there would be no public lavatories in a quarter like this. Then the spasm passed, leaving a dull ache behind. The street was a blind alley. Winston halted, stood for several seconds, wondering vaguely what to do, then turned round and began to retrace his steps. As soon as he turned, it occurred to him that the girl had only passed him three minutes ago, and that by running he could probably catch up with her. He could keep track on her till they were in the same quiet place, and then smash her skull in with a cobblestone. The piece of glass in his pocket would be heavy enough for the job. But he abandoned the idea immediately, because even the thought of making any physical effort was unbearable. He could not run. He could not strike a blow. Besides, she was young and lusty, and would defend herself. He thought of also hurrying to the community centre, and staying there till the place closed so as to establish a partial alibi for the evening. But it was too impossible. A deadly lassitude had taken hold of him. All he wanted was to get home quickly and then sit down and be quiet. It was after twenty-two hours when he got back to the flat. The lights would be switched off at the mains at twenty-three thirty. He went into the kitchen and swallowed nearly a teacup full of victory gin. Then he went to the table in the alcove, sat down, and took the diary out of the drawer. But he did not open it at once. From the telly screen, a brassy female voice was squalling a patriotic song. He sat staring at the marbled cover of the book, trying, without success, to shut the voice out of his consciousness. It was at night that they came for you. Always night. The proper thing was to kill yourself before they got to you. Undoubtedly, some people did so. Many of the disappearances were actually suicides. But it needed desperate courage to kill yourself in a world where firearms and any quick or certain poisons were completely unprocurable. He thought, with a kind of astonishment of the human biological uselessness of pain and fear, the treachery of the human body which always freezes into inertia at the exact moment when a special effort is needed. He might have silenced the dark-haired girl if only he had acted quickly enough, but precisely because of the extremity of his danger he had lost the power to act. It struck him that in movements of crisis one is never fighting against an external enemy, but always against one's own body. Even now, in spite of the gin, the dull ache in his belly made consecutive thought impossible. And it is the same, he perceived, in all seemingly heroic or tragic situations, on the battlefield, in the torture chamber, on a sinking ship, the issues that you are fighting for are always forgotten because the body swells up until it fills the universe. And, even when you are not paralysed by fright or screaming with pain, Life is a moment-to-moment -moment struggle against hunger, or cold, or sleeplessness, against a sour stomach, or an aching tooth. He opened up the diary. It was important to write something down. The woman on the telly screen had started a new song. Her voice seemed to stick into his brain like jagged splinters of glass. He tried to think of O'Brien, for whom, or to whom, the diary was written. But, instead he began thinking of the thing that would happen to him after the thought police took him away. It would not matter if they killed you at once. To be killed was what you expected. But before death, nobody spoke of such things, yet everybody knew of them. There was a routine of confession that had to be gone through. The groveling on the floor and the screaming for mercy, the crack of broken bones, the smashed teeth, and the bloody clots of hair. Why did you have to endure it, since the end was always the same? Why was it not possible to cut a few days or weeks out of your life? Nobody ever escaped attention. Nobody ever failed to confess. When once you had succumbed to the thought crime, 
it was certain that by a given date you would be dead. Why then did that horror which altered nothing have to lie embedded in future time? He tried, with a little more success than before, to summon up the image of O'Brien. We shall meet again in the place where there is no darkness, O'Brien had said to him. He knew what it meant, or he thought he knew. The place where there is no darkness was the imagined future which one would never see, but which, but which, by foreknowledge, one could mystically share in. But with the voice from the telescreen nagging at his ears, he could not follow the train of thought further. He put a cigarette in his mouth. Half the tobacco promptly fell out onto his tongue, a bit of dust which was difficult to spit out again. The face of Big Brother swam into his mind, deplacing that of O'Brien. Just as he had done a few days earlier, he slid a coin out of his pocket and looked at it. The face gazed up at him, heavy, calm, protecting. But what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark moustache? Like a leaden knell, the words came back at him. War is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance is strength. Thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed, and if you did, do subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you know when the next video goes live. Um, like, share, and all that jazz. And if you really want to support me, um, go to my Patreon. The link's in the bio. See you next time. Bye-bye.